On behalf of uh, Mary Lou and Andrew and Aaron and all of Dennis's family, I'd just like to welcome you here. And those of you that are watching in the Philippines or will see this on video, we're so thankful that you're joining. It would be difficult to take a life like this and to compress it into a day or a week long service and we're gonna try and do it in much less than that. Um, but I'm hoping that as you're here today and as we share together that there will be something that will give you a, a new insight that you'll actually learn something more than you already knew about Dennis today. And I was just upstairs reviewing some of the uh, emails. I saved everything you ever sent me and just reviewing some of those emails. And I have a keen hope that today each of us will not only hear from somebody and learn something more about Dennis, but that we'll learn something more about his Lord, that there will be an aspect of Jesus Christ that will jump out to us. And with that in mind, let me just pray to that same Lord and invite his presence this morning. Dear Lord, we come before you in gratitude, Father, as we celebrate a life that was so well lived and brought honor and glory to your name and brought so much joy and meaning to so many of our lives. We ask for your presence here. Lord, we thank you. And Father, we can't help but uh, pray for Mary Lou and for all of Dennis's family as they feel this uh, even stronger than we do. And we ask your blessing and your favor on each of them and on each one who will be sharing this morning. Would you be glorified here, Lord? I pray that uh, these proceedings today will just put a smile on your face and we would ask that you would uh, bless our friend. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Many of you know Mark Hansen and his incredible skills and Mark has taken from his extensive uh, files and put together a montage for us. <laughs> This is a great neighborhood, gee whiz, yeah. you know? Yeah, there it is. There it is. 227 Wyoming. Well, it hasn't changed much, has it? Look at how high those roofs are. <laughs> well, you jumped off of that roof several times. Was it when you had me jump off with the parachute, the umbrella, or the cardboard wings? Which was first? <laughs> well, we had a big beach umbrella. Uh -huh. And I figured you'd float down with the beach umbrella. Not it was but, heavier than I was, but it beats you to the ground. So we went with the uh, the sheet with the four corners tied to your belt. Didn't work. <laughs> no, and then the cardboard wings, of course. Not as hard cool. as you flap, they <laughs> they went straight down. You just disappeared over but the But I edge. still remember you saying, Larry, wait a minute. I did this before. It didn't work. No, 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 no. It works good. I tried it. It really, really works good. And I'd jump off, and after you'd, I'd hit the ground. You'd say, no, I was just teasing. I didn't try it out. <laughs> Broadwater Elementary School. Well, this is where a lot of the dramas kind of unfolded for me when I was a little kid because I think I was in third grade. So like right here, this is where we're, kids are all playing and there's this bully kid out there and there's this little girl here, kind of, they called her, her name was Peggy, but they were calling her Piggy, Piggy, Twinkle Toes, you're so fat, you got a fat nose. <laughs> and I just thought that was terrible. I walked over to the guy and I said, you can't talk to her that way. And he went, oh yeah? And he went, boom, hit me right in the nose. <laughs> and so we got into a fight. So the playground monitor, our teacher grabbed us and picked us off the ground and just took us right up those steps there. We just like not even touching the stairs and, and took us right into the third grade teacher and just, and <laughs> we're looking up at her and she says, what happened? And I told her what happened. And she said, Frankie, you go stand in the corner. Dennis, good job. My passion for <laughs> compassion. <Yeah. laughs> You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me When the road looks rough ahead And you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed 
You just remember what your old past said. Boy, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Actually, I have a degree in film and television production, majoring in cinematography. During that time, I needed a few extra classes that were a little less stressful, so I took a sign language class. And within a few weeks, the professor approached me and asked me if I wanted to join the Theater of Silence, which was a performing group that traveled the western half of the United States and did performances with deaf schools. 27, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Shortly after that, my marriage failed. Well, this was a time in my life when I was trying to figure out what to do next. God talked to me and said he wanted me to go out and serve. And I really wanted to do something more significant with my life. So I joined the Peace Corps. And Peace Corps gave me a chance to go to a country I'd never been to before. So they sent me to the Philippines. And that just changed the direction of my life dramatically. We'd like to send you out as a deaf education specialist. So they asked me if I wanted to have a pioneering or establish a type of work and I said well give me the pioneering so they sent me to the island of Bohol. When I got there they had one teacher and seven deaf students and that was it. And I thought this is not right no they've got to have hundreds and hundreds of deaf children here and so we began the process of trying to bring these deaf children down into school. They were mostly profound deaf children so that's why we brought them down to teach them sign language and giving them a language they could immediately use. I spent two years there initially with Peace Corps and we went from seven students and one teacher to about 65 students and four teachers. It just had a ball. It was just growing like crazy. When it was time to close down my contract with Peace Corps, I decided I'd like to set up a foundation. So I set up International Deaf Education Association and established it here in Billings, Montana. My wish is for them to grow up healthy and hopeful, believing in themselves. I want to see them have families of their own, work they can be proud of, and a community of deaf that will care for each other. Shortly after moving to Bohol, I had the good fortune to meet a beautiful young lady by the name of Mary Lou. Within a period of a couple of years later, she became my wife and became my ministry partner. I idea would not exist today without Mary Lou. She has been an amazing part of this work. The world has changed here in Bohol for them. It used to be that people would meet these people on the street and think they're mentally retarded. Now uh, they see them and just think, well, there's a person who's got a good job or there's a person who's going someplace. Well, I'd like to see someday where the idea is actually run by the deaf. That's where they're going. Some of these people right here will be the leaders of tomorrow and they'll run the organization. So I have to say about IDEA that it's been a real blessing to be part of this ministry. So I say that because it's not about me or what I've done. God did it. I'm just astounded that he laid out a plan and I was able to follow that plan just by putting one foot in front of the next. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand and nothing Oh, nothing is going right Close your eyes and think of me And soon I will be there To brighten up even your dark That could have been a few hours longer, right? Isn't that amazing? 
How about that motorcycle with the whole Drake family on one bike? Well, uh, right now I'd like to invite Andrew to come up and uh, we get to hear from two of the members of that uh, 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 family. Uh, Aaron has written a eulogy for us and Andrew's going to come and read that. Andrew, thank you so much for being all the way out here. Andrew drove over 13 hours to be here uh, with us this morning. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you guys for coming out to honor my dad's memory. Um, I wanted to read to you guys a eulogy that my, my brother wrote um, that was read at his funeral. Kind of all be together in this. Um, so Dennis was a beloved father, Pop-Pop, Lolo, husband, friend, Mr. Fix-It, servant, leader, visionary, and follower of Christ who gave all his energy to help others and ask for nothing in return. In the end, Dennis was blessed with the love and admiration of his family and thousands of friends in the Philippines, the United States, and beyond. His legacy will live on through his faithful and steadfast wife, Mary Lou, his children, Aaron and Andrew, his grandchildren, Koa, Tiare, and Reese, and the many friends that will continue on with Dennis's life work. Dennis was born to humble beginnings in Billings, Montana, on November 22nd, 1950. From a young age, Dennis wanted to help those who were hurting and in need. His heart was just built that way, and his parents, Vernon and Betty, nurtured that part of him. After graduating college, Dennis worked in advertising, which he did not like at all. By the end of his 20s, Dennis, Dennis was a broken man. His wife had left him, his career was unfulfilling, and he had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which threatened to eventually paralyze him. His life seemed to be crumbling around him. But God is a God of second chances. God is a God of great forgiveness and redemption. Dennis's life story is all about second chances and redemption. In 1980, Dennis was, wanted a fresh start somewhere far away from the United States, so he joined the Peace Corps. The following year, he was stationed on the remote tropical island of Bohol. On Bohol, Dennis met Johnny Fisher, who would become his lifelong friend and brother. Soon after, in 1984, Dennis met the woman of his dreams, Mary Lou, and together with Johnny, they laid the framework for IDEA, an organization that would go on to change the lives of thousands of deaf and hearing people on Bohol, Leyte, and beyond. Dennis and Marilou worked tirelessly together over the last 30 years to build IDEA and expand its reach to help increasingly more people in need throughout the islands. They encountered countless obstacles and experienced many hardships, but they persevered, motivated by their genuine Christ-inspired love for others. In 2014, Dennis was diagnosed with stage four cancer. The doctors gave him less than a year to live. Dennis knew that only God had the power of life and death. He went on to live seven more full and rich years after his fatal diagnosis, his broken body held up by the sovereign hands of the almighty God. Dennis could have received much better cancer and pain treatment in the United States, but he chose instead to stay in, in Bohol and continue serving the deaf community of the Visayas, knowing full well that he would not receive the medical care that he desperately needed here. He chose them, the deaf community of Bohol and Leyte, his God-given purpose over his own health and comfort. Dennis has shown us what a loving and willing sacrifice really is. Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay one's lay down one's life for one's friends. John 15, verse 12. God's fingerprints, his engineering, his timing, his planning is evident through all the events leading up to the moment when Dennis finally joined his family in heaven. God brought together Dennis's closest loved ones, his wife, children, grandchildren, his best friends, Johnny and Tata Fisher, Tata's sister, his sister-in-law, Jean, Tracy, Mia, and the rest of his idea family. And we all took on the role of Sherpas, helping him climb those last few meters up to heaven. And then God, God finally reached down and took Dennis by the hand and brought him home. Dennis touched so many lives and was a selfless, loving, and generous person. Dennis did not often preach using words, but he showed Christ's love in everything he did. He put his faith to work and in so doing transformed these islands forever. 
He believed in people and nurtured their natural abilities. He saw people not as they were, but as they would become. He believed in their potential. He encouraged them in that. Dennis was a genuinely great encourager. He deeply valued everyone he met and always thought the best of them. In return, many who felt cast out by society were empowered to succeed by Dennis Drake. All Dennis wanted to do was to continue working to help the deaf of these islands up until the day he was taken home. This was his God-given mission, and he was faithful to that calling, even to the very end. Dennis blessed us by sharing his life with us, and we will continue to treasure all our precious memories with him long after he has passed. Dennis was a remarkable man who taught us to wear our hearts on our sleeves and to think the best of everyone we meet. Thank you for being his friends and for loving him. Thank you so much. Thank you. James, would you come up and would you give Andrew a nice COVID fist bump along the way? Uh, Aaron, I don't know if you are watching this or if you'll get a chance to, but uh, thank you. That was incredibly well written, and it's good to feel like we have you here with us. Thank you so much. James, uh, James is reading from uh, Larry. Larry, that's right. So the ruffian that you saw in the video there trying to encourage Dennis to jump off of the roof at a young that's age. That's him. Yeah. Would you yeah, share some, Larry, you some of Larry's stories with us? Good morning, you guys. Thanks for coming out. Um, thanks for braving the cold to honor, and honor Dennis. And thank you to all of you who are online watching, Aaron and Ashley and the kids and Mary Lou in the Philippines. And then I know there's people in Wisconsin and Texas and Colorado, California watching, and, and even lots of them in Billings who, because of the roads and cold, couldn't make it. And um, I know my grandma, Harriet, is watching. She really wanted to be here, but with COVID and the roads, um, couldn't make it. So she's the last of Dennis's parents' generation and then, of course, Larry and Lana and, and uh, um, Teresa and Gary and Chrissy, um, all watching online. I'd like to just read a few verses that I think uh, the last few of them kind of describe Dennis so well. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any uh, common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, looking not only to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And those last few verses especially remind me of Dennis, uh, looking out for everybody's interests and um, and then also that call for unity, too. Uh, but um, for me, the family calls me Jamie. And so Dennis was uncle, and I was nephew Jamie. And in 07, after I surrendered my life to Jesus, I had the privilege of serving on a faith chapel mission trip and heading over there. And, and in, in one way, I got to follow in Dennis's footsteps and fell in love with the beautiful girl from the Philippines. And um, after our two-week trip, I said, Dennis, I have to come back. And so eight months later, I got to spend a few months with him and Mary Lou at their house and work on that relationship and uh, made a couple other trips where I stayed with Dennis and Mary Lou and enjoyed their hospitality and, and just did life with them. They're, they're so special. And uh, for me, Dennis rises above everybody in my life as far as a, a servant leader and just having that great compassion for people and never giving up. He never tired. He always... Uh, just had a joy about loving and serving, especially the deaf community in the Philippines. And um, so, uh, Larry, here's your, uh, Larry would have loved to have been here, um, but this is what Larry wrote, just a precious brother of Dennis. So, um, to many people, Dennis was a great humanitarian, and that is true. But to me, he embodied the consummate entrepreneur. He had the innate skill to think far outside the box, envisioning the impossible and the fortitude to make it happen. When others thought it couldn't be done, he did it. He often told me his accomplishments were born out of ignorance rather than talent. For Dennis, bringing his ideas and visions to reality represented the reward. His joy came from the discovery and creation of something new that would benefit others. That skill blossomed in the Philippines as a blessing to thousands of people in the deaf community. 
This talent was evident throughout his life, beginning with Kool-Aid stands and puppet shows for the neighbors. He always looked for creative ways to provide support. As a teen, he and his friend Jeff Butcher started a concrete busting business where they learned hand, where they learned hard manual labor isn't always properly rewarded. He and another friend tore down old billings to sell the popular barn wood uh, to interior designers. The full body costumes he fashioned of the San Diego Padres chicken mascot, which we watched, uh, and the Shields hardware bear were a hit in billings at ball games. In college, he sculpted beautiful wood birds using dad's bandsaw, created coin jewelry, fashioned replica Native American dream catchers, and even sold buffalo droppings under glass to tourists. <laughs> after, dad brought, uh, after dad bought him a broken down trailer to live in uh, while attending MSU in Bozeman, he learned the lessons um, in restoring that wreck into a lucrative business of buying, remodeling, and selling trailer homes to finance his, uh, his education. Dennett's filled his life with out-of-the-ordinary choices and accomplishments. He also had a lot of failures along the way, but that didn't deter him from trying new things. Once life took him to the Philippines, he found an unending supply of opportunity, starting with a little shack in the middle of Tagbalaran called the Garden Cafe, which many of you have eaten at. Begun by his friend and Peace Corps co-worker Johnny Fisher, Dennis took the reins, uh, learned through Hard Knocks the restaurant business and created jobs and income for the deaf community. That formed the springboard to dozens of other business ventures that have supported IDEA, its students and graduates for many years, all from the fertile mind of Dennis Drake. Donut shop, brick manufacturing, furniture building, fly tying, pizza wagons, construction business, sewing shop, hotel, recycling center, modular housing, and much, much more, all to the benefit of a once forgotten and ignored deaf population. Things didn't always work out. Exporting quality rattan furniture and handmade bamboo rakes from the Philippines to the U.S. was met with near disaster. Rice-burning stoves never took off. Pizza wagons sounded great but didn't find a home. Dozens of other ventures met with little or no success, but Dennis always seemed to find another idea to try. I will sorely miss our regular phone conversations where we spent hours talking about business ideas and concepts. He always had something new on his mind he wanted to run past me. To most entrepreneurs, financial gain is the goal and the reward. To Dennis, the happy faces of his deaf kids and the satisfaction of watching them learn and grow as a result of his efforts fulfilled him. People may think that the success of the International Deaf Education Association grew out of Dennis's love for the deaf children of Bohol. I believe that it is only partially true. I think his passion for taking not only the road less traveled, but the road unexplored is at the heart of IDEA's success. Without that vision and willingness to take enormous risks in the face of overwhelming opposition, IDEA would never have flourished. Dennis leaves behind a great legacy in that organization, and his creativity and adventurous spirit will be hard to replace. He and Mary Lou also produced two fine sons that exhibit many of the same traits as their dad. Um, I have no doubt that they will make their mark as well. Dennis made the world a better place with his presence. We will miss him, but I smile every time I picture his face. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, James. CC, would you join us? She, CC is going to uh, share some stories from Lana Drake. Thank you, dear friend. Glenn Grove has a voice like Dennis Drake. You just always feel calm around him. Thanks, Glenn. So I'm going to read um, Lana's story, Dennis's sister. In the early days of IDEA, when Mary Lou would fly to the U.S. with Dennis, she was so terrified of flying, the palms of her hands would drip with sweat the whole flight. But she was always there by his side. I remember how hard she studied for the citizenship exam that most Americans could not pass. 
While in Billings, their favorite pastime was yard sales. The two of them would usually return loaded down and excited over their finds to be sent back to Behold. Often there were appliances, etc., that didn't work, and Dennis would repair them and make them as good as new. They didn't have many resources, but it was amazing how they could stretch the ones they had. As a CPA, Mary Lou knows the value of a dollar. They would load up a shipping container with all of their finds. Dennis bought a donut shop. He had the whole Billings family involved in disassembling and packing for shipping. I saw a recent picture of the Garden Cafe kitchen with the old mixer still in use. Dennis told of a pressure-packed cube of used clothing that when they opened it, it exploded, sending clothes flying everywhere and filling up their living room. It seemed that somehow Dennis would be visiting in Billings when he was needed most by our parents through medical or other emergencies. He told how he and dad wept on the way home after dad's final doctor visit and terminal diagnosis in 2003. Dennis was able to remain and care for dad a couple of months before his sisters could come to take over. Dennis was creative in everything he did. His wood sculptures of birds were among some of his creations. He was a natural artist with an architectural flair. He was a mechanic and could fix and repair almost anything. So I'm going to share just a quick moment, a picture, a little vignette of Dennis Drake. We all know people based on relationship and experiences different. So how you know Dennis might be different than how I remember Dennis. But there was this moment when my son and I, who's here today, we, went, we got to go to, on one of the Philippines trips a few years back. And we were all, we had bags of dirt, which was so fun, actually. We were building um, a garden and just sweaty and dirty, and it was awesome. And there was just this whole line of kids on both sides of us. And I had asked Dennis a question, and he was a little far down the aisle, like about right there. And so he was answering me the question. And as he was, you know, he was ever using his hands. So he was speaking to me also with his hands. And I thought to myself for a moment, how awesome. Ever the teacher, he is kind of teaching me sign language. But I realized that although maybe he was doing that, that wasn't his primary goal. Because I noticed that on both sides of me, every single eye of at least 50 high school students were looking in only one direction, and it was towards Dennis. And he was including them in our conversation. And they were, the, the, the dirt stopped because Dennis was talking, and he was including them. And that is something I'll never forget. I was reading in Luke 24 this week, and Jesus had just been risen from the cross. He's with his boys. He's talking to the disciples, and he's saying, and they're, you know, it, it's big. They're seeing him for the first time, and he's like, you know, peace be with you. He shows his hands and his feet to them. And then he does this thing that made me think of Dennis, so that's why I'm sharing it. Right after that moment, that epic moment, he's done the most important event of all history. Jesus says, do you have any lunch? And I read that this week and just wept. It's too much. I said, Jesus, it's too much that you will be who you are and never lose the kindness and the humility to ask someone like you or me if you've got lunch for you. And that reminded me of Dennis Drake. He seemed to never lose the humility to include me and you. And he never seemed above us. He seemed right with us, loving us and including us like he did that day, talking to those kids and I at the same time. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Cece. Um, Uh, so, uh, those of you that know uh, Dennis well might be wondering why I'm standing here. And uh, I think that needs to be mentioned. It's because his good friend Ron was uh, inconsiderate enough to pass away uh, before uh, Ron could be doing this. And Dennis and Ron had worked out a plan of what Dennis wanted. And uh, um, 
It was really inconceivable, really, that Ron would go before Dennis. And I think most of you know uh, both of these gentlemen. And so I uh, just want to mention that because I love both of those men dearly. And uh, I shouldn't be here. And I fully intend to prove everybody wrong who said I should be doing this. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I, I can't help but think of Dennis and uh, his care for all of us. Eugene Peterson, in his uh, translation of the Bible, uh, takes each book and writes an introduction to it. In the introduction to the book of Acts, he writes, the story of Jesus doesn't end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about were no mere spectators of Jesus. There were no more spectators of Jesus than Jesus was a spectator of God. They were in on the action of God, God acting in them, God living in them, which also means, of course, in us. And we're here today to celebrate the life of a man who uh, you could look at it and it's almost like he stepped out of the book of Acts. That uh, I, I find it fascinating that the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. It's not the hopes of the apostles or uh, the good ideas of the apostles. It's the Acts of the Apostles. And Dennis was, if nothing else, a man of real, true action. Um, Psalm 16, 116.12, what can I give back to God for the blessing he's poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'd do, and I'll do it together with his people. When they arrive at the gates of death, God welcomes those who love him. What a fitting passage, and I love this line. I'll complete what I promised God I'd do, and I'll do it together with his people. I think most of us um, are here because Dennis included us. <laughs> that he, he said, I want to do this, but I'm not going to do it alone. I'm going to do it together with God's people. And he made sure that we got to do that with him. Um, I want to look at just really quickly five ways uh, that being on mission, being on God's mission with Dennis impacted my life. Um, five things that informed my faith, five things Dennis excelled at. First of all, uh, Dennis saw others as more important than himself. James went and just stole my verse from me. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 5. I'm going to read it in a deeper voice than him, though. Uh, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not uh, uh, count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the, the form of a servant and being born in likeness of man. Uh, Dennis ha he just embodied that. I think there's a reason James and I both picked that same passage to start with. It's because Dennis had the ability to take and see people who others thought were least and lost and to esteem this into the highest places and to make, uh, helped them to see themselves in that role too. Help them to see themselves how God did. Um, there's a, uh, a uh, famous uh, French uh, nun, uh, Sister Rosalie Rendu, and she wrote, you won't, it's not great theology, but I, I think you'll excuse me. Uh, you won't get into heaven without a letter of recommendation from the poor. Uh, I think Dennis has got a stack of uh, uh, letters there uh, that were waiting for him when he arrived. Um, Dennis, uh, Number two, Dennis gave of his talents. Matthew 25 tells us a story that I think many of you are familiar with of the parable of the talents where um, the master gives three servants uh, different amounts of talents. He gave some five, he gave one five and one two and one one. 
and of course one of them went and buried his talents and was not highly recommended for that and the other two went and took those talents and doubled them and and in each of those cases the lord said to them well done good and faithful servant and that's almost it's a refrigerator magnet verse it's a cliche at funerals but i don't know if i've ever seen it more appropriate than right here dennis was a man who more than doubled the talents he was given. He was given considerable gifts, but he took those gifts and he did amazing things with them. I don't know if I've ever known anybody who had a higher return on their talents than Dennis. And this is what I also loved about Dennis. I've known some brilliant men and women. And most of them struggled to understand that not everybody functioned at their level. Dennis never, I, I'm, I'm an absolute intellectual child compared to Dennis. I, I could, I, there's nothing he can do. I, more talent in his little pinky, right? Another cliche. Dennis never made me feel slow. Dennis never made me feel incompetent. And I'm all of those things uh, in his shadow. But he didn't dwell on that. He had the ability to look at what are the talents that God gave this individual, whatever they were, and to help them be one of those people that, the Lord could look at and say, well done, good and faithful servant. W what a talent. And I, I honestly think we'd be standing here, we'd be, if Dennis had one talent, we would still be standing here doing this. But he had many. But one of his great talents was getting the most out of those of us who were around him. I'm a better man. I'm a, I'm a better servant. Because Dennis was one of my friends and one of my coaches. And I just love that about him. Um, <laughs> we could go all day. I, seriously, I'm going to try and keep this under four hours, I promise. But, <laughs> but I just remember, like, I can't, it's like hard to pick which story to tell you when you think of his talents. But I remember when he was fairly far along in this sickness and uh, he had picked me up at the airport, uh, Brenda and I, and it was late at night and we we're stepping into his house. And there was, he had a couple of these odd looking, they were like thick tiles leaning up against the door and some odds and ends there. And, uh, and as we were walking past him, I backed up. I said, Dennis, what, what's going on here? He said, well, I'm having so much trouble sleeping at night. Many of you know he would watch old black and white uh, movies. And uh, it's funny, I remember calling him and like, what are you doing? He says, uh, Errol Flynn, I think it was uh, Robin Hood, you know, um, but uh, I, I saw these things. I said, Dennis, what's this? He says, well, when I'm having trouble sleeping at night, I just, my, my, my brain is just going. So I get up and he said, I've got this problem. We're trying to build workers housing and, um, but how do we build a strong, sustainable, solid housing for them? Uh, the expense is so much. Plus when we get them close together, there's such fire damage. He says, I'm, I wake up at two in the morning and, and i just, my brain won't shut off. He said, and, and I had another problem. I said, here in Bohol, we have a couple of rice mills. And he said, they have these mountains of rice holes and they won't rot. They can't burn them. Don't know what to do with them. And I said, they can't burn them. And he said, so I went and got a whole bunch of those and I started mixing up different uh, uh, mediums and putting them in that. And I'm making panels here so that we can make big sheets of it and start building houses out of it. <laughs> that's, that's what I do when I can't sleep in the night, right? Isn't that what you guys do? I, and, and to him, and, which he did, by the way, he, he did do that, um, built houses out of these panels. Um, but to think for him, it's a disposable idea. I mean, it's just one of countless. I mean, how many of you guys remember the shot puts? Uh, so uh, the, the island says, the governor says, um, everybody, uh, all the businesses have to recycle. And so they are going to send around and pick up all of the bottles and things from all of these restaurants and bars and all that, and they had to be recycled. Well, of course, uh, IDEA had a number of uh, establishments. And, um, and so that was a little bit of a hassle, but it was fine. And then the governor says, well, we're not going to come around and pick them up anymore, but you have to recycle. Ding, ding, ding. Dennis's mind goes nuts and says, Oh, there's a job right there for some people. We can go and pick up bottles. But then you have mountains of bottles. What do you do? What do you do just exactly what any ordinary person you or I would do? You order a bunch of shot puts off the internet 
and you buy a big old cement mixer and you throw the bottles in the cement mixer at the shop puts and you grind them up and you make pavers out of them, right? That's what you would do, isn't it? That's what I would do. I mean, just on and on. It was just endless. Um, but I just love that uh, Dennis was an incredibly talented man who gave those talents back to the Lord. And just like both of those examples I shared with you, he just pulled people into those ideas and he met people where they were at and with the talents that they had and he helped them exceed. Number three, um, Dennis held God, family, and ministry in perspective. Oh, that's so hard to do. I can't imagine being as talented as Dennis, as driven as he was, and to have one of his sons write such a beautiful eulogy and to have another son who would drive all the way out here to read it to us and to have a wife who adores him. And I, I couldn't even guess how much time I've spent with Dennis, how many emails are on my computer and how many phone calls now in some of the most stressful situations, far more stressful situations than I've ever experienced in my life. And nothing, and I have not one single memory, not one of him speaking anything other than kindness about his wife, love and support, praise and honor. He adored Mary Lou, and not just as uh, uh, an amazing wife, but as a, as a ministry partner. To hear him talk about you boys, Andrew, is phenomenal. The greatest joy of his life was having you guys around him and the opportunity that he had to work with you and your brother. Um, I, I just love that. And Dennis had this ability to... Um, he would do things. He wrote a letter... Uh, to his family recently. And um, then it's a, I'm just going to read little bits of it. Uh, but then he had the kindness to do things like send it to me too and say, you're my family uh, too. But he wrote, my dear family, as I lay in bed with congestive heart failure that will soon take my life, I find my situation a small thing in light of what is happening to our beautiful United States of America. I love, this is what an example of him holding God, family, and ministry in perspective. That Dennis is, uh, this is shortly before he passed away, and he finds what was happening in our nation a small thing, or in his own life a small thing compared to what's happening in our nation. Uh, and it, later on he continues, he says, I do not call myself a Republican or a Democrat, but rather an American who loves my country, but most of all, loves my Lord Jesus. I just love his ability to hold these things. This is the tension of ministry, life, family, patriotism. To put them all in the right perspective and to do it in the context of dying and knowing that he's passing away. Just an amazing thing. He says, I love you, family. I pray for peace in your homes and in your relations with great affection, George Dennis Drake brother, dad, relative. Number four. Uh, and we've already touched on this, but everything Dennis did was done with excellence. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. I don't know how many of you ever had the privilege of following Dennis in the morning on a routine where he would pull out a notepad and there would be an entourage of people walking with him. And it wasn't just in the morning, but he would do this in, you know, at different job sites. And he would just be walking and say, why is that sidewalk cracked? Why wasn't that done better than this? And he would, okay, let's fix that. And he would just walk along and everything was done with excellence. But just like CC shared, it wasn't a condemning excellence. It was a teaching excellence that said, this is how we choose to do things. We choose to do things in ways that um, will bring glory and honor to Jesus and also will uh, help us to present our, our very best foot forward, that, that the deaf community is capable of the very highest level of work. Isn't that something, though, that, that a people who... Um, so often weren't able to see themselves as valuable at all. And Dennis was able to say, you're not only valuable, you're some of the most valuable, and you are capable of the highest quality of work, so let's work together to do that. I love that about him. Um, he had high but not unreasonable expectations for himself and others, and he contended for his excellence, for excellence in all his things. And then uh, finally, number five, uh, and 
it's not finally, right? This is stories and things that we'll just keep sharing and attributes of uh, Dennis that will continue on for many years. Um, but he said, but he, he always made room for the gospel. Dennis, um, he was uncomfortable with the word missionary. He didn't like to be called a missionary. Um, he definitely was on mission. Uh, he uh, wasn't anybody who wanted to stand up in front and preach the gospel, but he preached the gospel all the time. He preached it through his life, but he wasn't one of those that, you know, there's a saying, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words, which is really a refrigerator magnet kind of saying, but it's not really gospel. Um, it's, that it's accurate, but it's only partially accurate because words are really important. And Dennis never quit using words. He was constantly in emails and in person. He was reminding people of who Jesus is and who Jesus is in our life. Just in the letter that I just read you all the way to the end of his life, he was consistent and he was faithful in proclamation. Um, the Tip Tip Church, I think, is a great example of that. D Dennis recognized and realized that the one, God doesn't have a plan B. His chosen vehicle for transformation in our world is the body of Christ. And it's not the church as in a building or a, a label, but it is us. It's the people, the body of Christ. And that is who God has chosen to bring about transformation. And Dennis also recognized that each one of us the highest level of transformation that we need it is in our own spiritual walk. Scripture doesn't tell us that we uh, need to fix our hearts. It says our hearts need to be exchanged for a whole new heart. You can't fix this heart. It just has to be exchanged for one that the Lord will give us. And Dennis recognized that and was so faithful in helping other people understand that. Uh, he wanted the best for people. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, and when I came to you, brothers, I did not come uh, proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Dennis, that wasn't Dennis. He had lots of wisdom, but he didn't, he wasn't grandiose in his uh, sermonizing. Uh, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. One of the beauties, one of the backwards beauties of these last years is that we got to see Dennis in weakness. Up to that point, it had just been strength, but we got to see Dennis in real weakness. We got to see what does a man of God look like when everything is against him, when it's pretty clear how this is going to play out. Does he give up into despair or does he continue on and does he also continue to invest in the lives of those around him? Um, we uh, were not it were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstrations of the spirit and of the power that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Demonstrations of the spirit. A couple of weeks ago, N Nate Petzl, the senior pastor here, stood on this stage and he said, um, the best apologetic, the best description, the best explanation for the gospel is a changed life. Uh, Dennis died surrounded by lives that the Lord had used him to help change. I'm, I'm one of those lives that's been changed and impacted by the life of Dennis. I, I just, I feel like I'm standing in front of family and I feel like that's why it's easy enough to be this vulnerable with you, but I have to imagine that it's possible that there's somebody who's watching online or seeing this in video three years from today. And your life hasn't been transformed. You haven't experienced that transformation of Jesus Christ. But you knew Dennis. And I want to tell you from Dennis's own words, many, many times spoken and written to me, that Dennis understood that all the transformation in his own life and all the transformation that he was allowed to work in the lives of others was based on this one thing, that Jesus Christ is in the process of wooing and reconciling us to himself. And I would like to invite you to explore that kind of transformation. And so I'm done here in just a minute, but uh, uh, Daryl and Juanita, would you raise your hands? Uh, there's Daryl and there's Juanita. Um, they and many others, but Daryl and Juanita have said that they would love to pray with any of you. Not about anything, really. 
Um, but if you would like to talk to them about a transforming life in Jesus Christ, they would love to meet with you. Um, we have a reception uh, afterwards in the atrium, and you're all invited to that. And we also have uh, a DVD, a movie of Dennis's life. Uh, would love to put that into the hands of each family who's represented here today. Um, and finally, uh, Andrew let me finish uh, his brother's eulogy, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but this is how Aaron uh, continued for just a couple more paragraphs. He said, thank you for being his friends and for loving him. One day, in God's timing, we will meet Dennis again. Until then, I ask you to continue Dennis's legacy, creating a more equitable society for deaf and hearing persons alike, and treating everyone with the love of Christ. Because without Christ, we can do nothing. He is the source of our strength. May God comfort us all as we continue to process the loss of this amazing person. Before I end, I would before I end, I would like to play you a song by the late Hawaii musician, Israel Kamakawa Ua Wia Oli, something like that. The song is Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and it was one of my dad's favorite songs. As he laid in the hospital, hospital bed about an hour before he finally passed, unable to speak and in severe pain, I had decided to play this song to help soothe him. Halfway through the song, my dad made a noise, and I thought he wanted me to stop the song, so I did. I said, sorry, Dad, I can turn it off now. With a strained voice, he mustered all of his energy to say, I love it, I love it. So I played the full song for him. It was the last song that my father listened to, and I'd like to share it with all of you today. The family will be ushered out while this is playing. If you wouldn't mind, just stay and listen to this song and reflect on a life very well lived. Thank you. <laughs> 